Let's make get rid of the laser pointer. Oh, there we go. Okay, that's a disclosure slide. So I, I um, am involved in a company called Epileptic GTX, uh, which is aiming to develop some of these for the clinic. Uh, so just a few numbers. So drug-resistant epilepsy or, or pharmaco-resistant epilepsy uh, is an enormous problem. Epilepsy as a whole affects about 1% of the population. So that means that uh, there's a lifetime risk of, about, of having a seizure of about 10%. But actually having epilepsy, which is spontaneous recurrent seizures, affects about 1% of the population. There's a U-shaped incidence. Uh, it can start in early childhood. It can start later in life. And there are numerous causes of epilepsy. Uh, genetic de disorders, birth defects, developmental abnormalities, uh, brain injuries, infections, strokes, tumors. And late in life, there's a lot of epilepsy that's thought to be caused by um, by uh, degenerative processes. Now, about 30% of people with epilepsy continue to have seizures despite optimal medication. So that's what we call pharmacoresistant or refractory or drug-resistant epilepsy. It means that, that although the, the drugs may have some partial effect in reducing the frequency of seizures, it's not possible to make patients seizure-free uh, while taking medication. And if people have failed on two or three drugs uh, at adequate doses and adequate durations, then the chance of achieving seizure freedom after that drops right down to below 5%. So you can imagine this is a major health burden. People with epilepsy as a whole uh, have a lot of restrictions on driving and certain types of employment, but there are also some, so, some stigma, social uh, implications, as well as comorbidities, as well as side effects of medication. And patients with uh, epilepsy that can't be controlled by medication also have an elevated mortality. Now, why does this? Why do people become pharmacoresistant? Well, if you think about the mechanisms of seizures, the classical simple analogy is where excitation exceeds inhibition, uh, and the, the drugs that we use uh, typically act on on the mechanisms that underlie excitation or inhibition. Uh, so, for instance. Uh, the fundamental mechanisms underlying excitation in the brain involve such processes as voltage gated sodium channels and glutamate receptors, while the processes that underlie inhibition uh, include such uh, processes, such, such signaling cascades as potassium channel function, as well as GABA receptors, which are type of chloride channels. And so the drugs that we use, a lot of them actually do target these mechanisms. So there are drugs that inhibit sodium channels or drugs that inhibit the glutamate receptors. And there are also drugs that potentiate the function of potassium channels and of GABA receptors. Uh, so these are a lot of uh, the mechanisms that we already harness to uh, try to stop seizures. They're effectively based on the final mechanisms underlying seizures. Uh, there are a few ex exceptions. So valparate and levetiracetam are a couple of very useful drugs which don't actually work through these mechanisms as far as we know. So why is it that 30% of people continue to have seizures? Well, part of it is a limitation on the dosage of, that you can give to patients. So drugs uh, acting um, to stop seizures actually act on the entire brain. They, they don't just in, act on the neurons involved in seizures. And so if you were able to push up the dose sufficiently, you might be able to bring seizures under control. But of course, that would be at the risk of side effects, which can be unacceptable. But there are other underlying processes which are like less well understood, such as uh, possibility that the drugs don't actually reach their target because of drug transporters expressed in the brain. And there is also, of course, the possibility that the underlying mechanisms may be different in some patients who have pharmacoresistant epilepsy. In fact, epilepsy as a whole is not just one disease. I already mentioned lots of different etiologies, but there are also different types of epilepsy depending on which part of the brain is involved. And in fact, the type of epilepsy that is extremely often pharmacoresistant is epilepsy where the seizure arises from a specific part of the brain. That's what we call focal epilepsy, as opposed to primary generalized epilepsy, where the seizures arise simultaneously in both hemispheres. The other problem, of course, with drug treatment is that if you potentiate inhibition of inhibitor neurons, that's equivalent to excitation. So there are numerous different reasons why why there are some limitations of pharmacotherapy in, uh, in epilepsy. So what else can we do? Well, some people with focal refractory epilepsy can undergo surgery 
so this is an, uh, an MRI image showing um, a patient uh, before and after temporal lobectomy. You can see the arrow pointing to the missing um, temporal lobe uh, on the right. Uh, but this is, of course, only feasible in a small proportion of patients where the, the seizure focus is easy to identify and is relatively far away from eloquent brain areas. And so if the seizure focus involves the language centers or the primary motor cortex, then there's a serious risk of permanent neurological deficit. So what else can we do? Well, this is where advanced therapies come in. So advanced therapies means cell therapy, uh, gene therapy, and RNA therapy. And in fact, cell therapy has already got into the clinic. There is a clinical trial under, ongoing currently, a company called Neurona, which has started to transplant uh, um, stem cells, which have been derived uh, from a, a single individual and been transformed to generate inhibitory into neuron progenitors. And they have started a clinical trial of cell therapy in patients with temporal lobe epilepsy and have reported some success in a couple of patients. Uh, RNA therapy uh, using antisense oligonucleotides or other ways of uh, delivering synthetic uh, RNAs uh, is actually also in the clinic in the form of clinical trials for some very, very rare genetic forms of epilepsy where there's a specific target uh, where you want to alter the expression of a single gene. But this is difficult to uh, focus onto a specific area of the brain, so it's more appropriate for primary generalized epilepsy. As I say, it's only being tested for some very, very rare forms of genetic epilepsy. So gene therapy is what I'm going to talk about for the rest of this uh, presentation. So gene therapy involves delivering uh, some genetic elements, typically DNA, but you can also deliver RNA uh, into a specific part of the brain and using a viral vector. And so the two viral vectors that are most widely used are adeno-associated virus or AAV, uh, which is a very small virus. There, there's a picture there showing and the schematic showing that the viral particle is only about 25 nanometers across. And it is a, a DNA virus. And typically, uh, you would be delivering a promoter, which drives the expression of a transgene. You can optionally have a reporter gene, which would be, for instance, a fluorescent protein for detection in a preclinical model, although you wouldn't have that in the final version of the uh, gene therapy that goes into patients. And there are a few other uh, elements which alter gene expression. Otherwise, people also use lentivirus, uh, which is derived from HIV. So this is an RNA virus, uh, and this is quite a lot larger. And so one of the downsides of using lentivirus is it doesn't spread very well in the brain, but it does have a larger packaging capacity than uh, AAV. All right, so the point about gene therapy is it allows a rational approach to treat focal epilepsy because you can restrict treatment to the seizure focus. That's by delivering the viral vector specifically to the area of the brain where the seizures arise without affecting the rest of the brain. You can bias expression of transgenes to specific neuronal populations by use of appropriate promoters which are active in different cell types. And you can use uh, transgenes which affect neuronal excitability or neurotransmitter release. So what sort of preclinical models do you need in order to um, advance gene therapy development? Well, in our laboratories, we've been using a number of different models, including uh, a model of neocortical epilepsy where tetanus toxin is injected into the cortex. This temporarily inhibits inhibi um, inhibitory signaling. So it then predisposes to spontaneous seizures which persist for quite a long time, sometimes permanently, depending on which uh, area of the brain that you inject. Another very widely used model of uh, focal epilepsy is temporal epilepsy, where seizures arise from the hippocampal formation. And you can do that by injecting canic acid, which excitotoxin into the amygdala or into the hippocampus. This induces status epilepticus, and then following a uh, latent period, um, the animals start having spontaneous seizures. And then finally, I'll talk a little bit about focal cortical dysplasia, which is an important subtype of focal refractory epilepsy, uh, which has recently been um, understood. And I'll talk about that in a bit more detail in a moment. Now, of course, how do we monitor seizures? This has required quite, quite a lot of infrastructure. So my colleagues and I established a, a rodent telemetry facility where we could 
uh, do long-term EEG and video recording. We also developed, together with a collaborator in the States, a type of wireless transmitter. So we, we implant these transmitters subcutaneously into rats or mice, and then we can continuously record the EEG or the electrocorticogram, call that the ECOG. We also do behavioral tests because we, it is important, of course, to verify that the treatment doesn't cause any sort of behavioral off-target effects. And at the bottom there, you can see a, a sample spectrogram uh, as well as the raw trace of a seizure. Uh, and we had to develop, devise some machine learning algorithms in order to detect these font, um, automatically rather than having to trawl through enormous amounts of, of electrical corticogram manually, which, as you can imagine, would be very, very labor intensive. So we use machine learning to identify these in an unbiased way. So which therapeutic transgene should we use? So we first started by using KV1.1. It's a voltage-gated potassium channel, which is very widely expressed in the central nervous system and peripheral nervous system. Uh, it's a cross-section of a, or a sagittal section of a mouse brain showing that there's a lot of KV1.1 in the cerebellar cortex, but in fact, it's also present throughout the nervous system. It's mainly expressed in axons, and I stumbled across this potassium channel because mutations of this channel uh, are associated with a neurological disease called, episode, called episodic ataxia type 1, where patients have episodes of cerebellar ataxia. And I was studying the function of this gene and realized that overexpression of the wild type gene could cause neurons and circuits to become less excitable, uh, while the mutations cause the opposite effect. And so we thought that perhaps if we overexpress this potassium channel in epileptic tissue, we might be able to stop seizures. So um, this was um, started, as I say, about, about 15 years ago. And we found that indeed, if we use different viral vectors to overexpress KV1.1 in rodent models of epilepsy, it was uh, effective and it was well tolerated. And we reported this using a lentiviral approach using a promoter called CMV, which is a very powerful non-specific promoter. We did that in a model of rat neocortical epilepsy. This is the tetanus toxin model. We also replicated this in a visual cortex model and changed the promoter to something called CAM kinase type 2, CAMK2, and that is uh, more specific for excitatory neurons. It's not completely specific for excitatory neurons, but it biases expression towards excitatory neurons. And we verified that this was effective in a model of temporal lobe epilepsy. We then used another approach using CRISPR activation. So you all heard of CRISPR as a way of cutting the DNA. Here we're using CRISPR simply as a way of recruiting uh, a, a transcriptional activator to the promoter region. And we did that for the mouse model of temporal lobe epilepsy. And again, it was effective. More recently, we um, performed a study in focal cortical dysplasia, which are show in a second. Uh, and then finally, um, I will also talk about some work using an activity dependent promoter, CFOS, which switches on in uh, epileptic neurons. So this is the typical design for our studies. We randomize animals to have either the um, active virus or the, the, um, the uh, control virus. So here is the, a raster plot showing um, every seizure that this animal had uh, during a, about uh, five weeks of recording. And you can see that um, the, uh, the lentiviral uh, vector was injected at time zero uh, after the animals had developed spontaneous seizures. Uh, and we um, injected control animals with a virus which just had a green fluorescent protein, reporter protein, but no. Um, no potassium channel. And we did this in a large number of animals. Uh, and these are all the raster plots for all the different animals. And you can see that different animals have different baseline seizure frequencies. So we had to then normalize by the baseline seizure frequency. Uh, and this is the result. And so you can see a highly significant difference in the frequency of seizures between the animals that receive the GFP, the green fluorescent protein control virus, or the placebo, if you like, uh, and those animals that received the engineered potassium channel. We call the engineered potassium channel or EKC because we modified the transgene, uh, uh, codon optimized it, and we inserted another mutation 
uh, to make it uh, work a bit better. So this is a, a randomized blinded trial. So we try to do this as, in, in a way that's as similar as possible to a human clinical trial by randomizing and blinding and analyzing uh, all, all the animals and uh, before um, unblinding ourselves. So as I mentioned, this worked in a number of different um, epilepsy models. Uh, but I'd like to talk about focal cortical dysplasia now. So this is a malformation of cortical development, uh, and it's increasingly understood as a very important subtype of focal refractory epilepsy. So uh, the children who have this and the adults uh, often have comorbid comorbidities such as learning disability and autistic features, uh, and it's caused by mutations uh, during brain development. So these mutations are somatic, so they don't occur in the uh, germline, they occur during brain development. And depending on the, the stage of development at which the, the mutation occurs, uh, you can either have a very, very small area of the brain, less than a cubic centimeter, or you can have a whole hem hemisphere affected. And these mutations, it turns out, mainly affect uh, the mammalian target of rapamycin, mTOR, and they lead to hyperactivation of mTOR. The mTOR is an extremely important signaling hub, which is involved in, in growth and, uh, and metabolic and response to meta metabolic signals. And so these children have an area of dysplasia, uh, which can actually be mimicked in an in utero electroporation model. So here what we do is we take mice when they're still in their mother's embryo uh, uh, uterus, and we electroporate a plasmid. So we push a, a bit of DNA into the developing brain by putting um, this plasmid into the ventricle and then putting um, some electrodes across the uterine horn. Uh, and then that pushes this plasmid into the developing brain on one side. And then after the mice are born, we then verify that they have, um, have been electroporated correctly because we can see some fluorescence in one hemisphere that corresponds to the, the area of the brain uh, where we've put this plasmid. And we use a plasmid which uh, leads to the overactivation of mTOR. It's called uh, REB. It's a constitutively active version of REB, uh, which is upstream of mTOR complex one. So what happens is that these animals have an area of dysplasia where the neurons are abnormal, they're enlarged, and there is loss of uh, gray-white matter lamination. There's also an increase in uh, um, phospho uh, S6, which is a, um, a, a signature of this, um, this disorder. And so this is work that was undertaken by Amanda Vincent Gabriele, whose pictures are on the right. So again, what we do in this situation is we create these, um, these animals with focal cortical dysplasia. We then recruit them into a preclinical study. So we record a baseline. We have to implant them with these transmitters. We record a baseline. Uh, we perform behavioral tests. We then do the gene therapy. And then we wait a couple of weeks for the virus to start expressing. We then record another period and then repeat the, the behavioral tests. And so here's uh, uh, the results of this recent study where we used the same chem kinase promoter to drive the potassium channel, EKC, there's the um, engineered potassium channel. So the panel at the bottom there uh, shows um, all the seizures displayed in a different way where every row is a different mouse, every column is a different day. There's two weeks of baseline recording, and then we inject the virus in the middle, and then we wait uh, for two weeks for the virus to express, and then we record another two weeks. And you can see that all the animals had a, a decrease in seizure frequency, and some of them became seizure-free. On the left are the animals that were randomized to receive the green fluorescent protein uh, as a control virus, uh, so GFP. There's slightly fewer animals on this side uh, because we lost a few animals, and, uh, uh, and so only included those animals where we had uh, an almost complete data set. The crosses is where we, we were unable to record for, for technical reasons. So again, we did the analysis and showed a highly significant difference in the frequency of seizures uh, in the animals that received the active virus compared to the animals that received the control virus. And of course, we did the behavioral studies. So we, we ran the mice in a number of different studies, uh, different tests, and showed no off-target effects. These animals did actually show 
under baseline conditions, they did show some impairment in some fat, some uh, tests such as uh, spontaneous alternation, which is sensitive to frontal lobe function, and also in a social um, recognition test. Uh, but these tests are uh, showing that this is a good model because, as I say, the patients are often uh, impaired in some uh, in some uh, functions. But we saw no worsening of these uh, of performance. All right, so th this is um, quite encouraging. So we can stop the seizures, uh, and we can also um, do so in a way that doesn't uh, uh, exacerbate uh, underlying uh, behavioral deficits. Uh, a general limitation of gene therapy where you inject the virus into a part of the brain is that it treats all the neurons in that area of the brain. And so Gabriele Lignani, whose uh, picture you, you saw a moment ago, uh, um, came up with a strategy that aims to target selectively those neurons that are overactive while sparing intermingled or bystander neurons. So this is a cartoon that, that um, illustrates the concept. So on the left here, you can see uh, under the ground state, if you imagine this is a sort of schematic of how the brain might work, there are some neurons that are firing more than others. In an epileptic brain, uh, you may have uh, some neurons which are selectively uh, increased. Uh, they, they show a selective increase in firing, uh, while other neurons are still continuing to fire uh, in a relatively normal way. So if we did uh, constitutive gene therapy that affects all the neurons in this area, you might be able to bring down the activity of those overactive neurons, but at the cost of making other neurons hypoactive. So how can we avoid that and try to return the brain to something a bit more like the ground state? So this is where uh, this concept of closed loop gene therapy came up. So what we want to do is to just to treat the neurons that are involved in seizures and not to treat the neurons which are um, firing at baseline uh, frequencies. So we want to somehow find a way of targeting um, these hyperactive neurons. So what we did was to put the, um, the transgene, instead of putting it under the promoter such as CAM kinase or CMV, which drives expression uh, in all the neurons which are infected, uh, well, well CAM kinase does, as I say, bias uh, to some extent towards excitatory neurons. What we want to do is to only allow the uh, transgene to be expressed if the neuron is hyperactive. Now, there's a family of genes called immediate early genes, uh, which switch on um, expression of their gene product, specifically when neurons are hyperactive. So CFOS is a very well-established immediate early gene. Uh, and so under baseline conditions, CFOS is not expressed at high levels, but after seizures, you can see a very high level of CFOS expression. So we took the promoter for CFOS. So we didn't take the CFOS gene itself. We took the promoter for CFOS, and we drove our potassium channel under that um, promoter. So you can see the concept is in the neurons which are infected with this construct, the CFOS promoter um, is not active until the neurons participate in seizures. This then leads to the expression of a potassium channel, which then in closed loop turns down the excitability of those neurons. So this, as I'd say, was work that it was led by Gabriele together with uh, Yu Chen and Nathaniel. Uh, and so this is a schematic of the preclinical trial. Again, we induce epilepsy. Uh, we then implant the animals um, and then uh, record a baseline. Then we do the gene therapy and then we record uh, the seizures afterwards as well. And again, this is a schematic. In this case, is a raster plot showing a number of different mice uh, either treated with the control virus on the left or treated with the CFOS potassium channel virus. Uh, that's the red plot there. And again, you can guess that the vast majority of the animals either became seizure-free or had a very profound decrease in seizure frequency. Um, and we had no off-target effects on a number of behavioral tests. Uh, we actually also validated this to some extent in human cerebral assembloids, where we take the excitatory and inhibitory neurons derived from stem cells, glue them together, and then, and then study them um, in vitro. Uh, so this was published last year. Now, th these approaches uh, are based on reducing excitability, mainly using this potassium channel, uh, but what else can we do? So we need to understand seizure mechanisms in greater detail to see if we can get other insights into how to uh, approach this problem. So a few years ago, together with uh, Federico Rossi, Rob Weix, and Matteo Carandini, 
we started to do that using a wake head fixed mouse model. So here, the mice are awake, they run on a ball, uh, their head fixed, and you can record the, from these mice for about half an hour uh, before having to put them back in that cage. And then you go back the next day and record again. And so what we found was that seizures um, in common with uh, epilepsy, epilepsy in humans, the seizures were not continuous, but they um, obviously occurred intermittently. But also we saw uh, what we call intrinsic discharges. So on the left is a schematic of the wide field image. You can see down the microscope. So this is part of the visual cortex, V1, and you can see the blood vessels. Uh, and uh, at the bottom of the schematic showing where we put the recording electrode. And in the recording electrode, we also had a chemoconvulsant to induce seizures. So this is picotoxin, which blocks GABA at receptors. But we also used pilocarpine, which is a muscarinic receptor agonist, and that also gave very similar results. So on the right, what you can see is the sort of activity that we did, uh, recorded when we looked at calcium. So this is a calcium fluorescence. And so you can see a seizure spreading across the brain, um, gradually involving different parts of the different territories. This is slowed down twofold, so you can actually see the evolution. Otherwise, it'd be too fast to, to, to detect all the subtleties. But the important thing is that in addition to those seizures, we also saw those intrarectal discharges, which self-terminate. So we asked, why do spikes or intrarectal discharges self-terminate, but seizures spread? I think analogy is a bit like a fire blanket. So the brain has mechanisms to stop seizures. These are built-in mechanisms which prevent runaway excitability. And th there's a long literature on what these intrinsic discharges mean, but they're a, they're a biomarker of focal epilepsy. So patients with focal epilepsy, if you record their scalp EEG, you may only capture one seizure every so often, but you often have in between seizures these little brief discharges, which I think are the same thing as what we detect in, these, um, in this mouse model. And I think what it represents is this last ditch attempt to stop a seizure from escaping inhibitory restraint. So this concept of inhibitory restraint has been around for about 30 or 40 years. Uh, and there are numerous different mechanisms uh, which have been proposed uh, how um, intrinsic uh, discharges can escape from inhibitory restraint, such as runaway excitability caused by failure of GABA release uh, or, um, uh, or the GABA itself be, being uh, pro-excitatory because if the chloride um, gradient across membranes collapses, then eventually the GABA fails to stop um, excitability. And there are other hypotheses such as a buildup of extracellular potassium, which might also contribute. So what we record in um, in these mouse models of, of focal epilepsy, where we induce seizures using a chemoconvulsant, are these intrinsic spikes um, and these and these seizures. And often at the beginning of an of a seizure, you see an intrinsic spike, which is called a sentinel spike, which looks very very similar to the um, to the intrinsic spikes. And as I say, those are, uh, if we look at the calcium imaging, we see these um, in the same way as these brief discharges that self terminate or else they lead on to a seizure that then spreads across the cortex. So more recently, uh, we use GABA and glutamate imaging. So these are the two main neurotransmitters in the brain. GABA is the inhibitory and glutamate is excitatory, obviously. And we use fluorescent reporters to detect these in the cortex. And this is a work that was mainly done by Yoshitero and, and Vincent. And these reporters were, were given to us by Lauren and Jonathan. And so again, we had a head fixed awake mouse model. We induce epileptiform activity using picotoxin or pilocarpine. Uh, and these animals are, are in, a, in an arena where they can actually move around on what is a little bit like an air hockey table. It's a very, very light carbon um, platform which can float on some air jets. And we do um, multi photon imaging using a, a spiral scan. So we're scanning in, in um, the extracellular space. Uh, just underneath the pier, uh, about uh, 100 um, microns into the into the cortex. And what you can see with these intrinsic discharges is that they are accompanied by a lot of GABA. So the top the top trace there is the, the GABA uh, fluorescent reporter signal, uh, as well as a large discharge of glutamate uh, in the bottom trace. Uh, and both of these accompany each of those intrinsic spikes um, and, uh, and so there are a number of patterns that we detected, which we're still trying to understand. 
so the glutamate signal gets smaller as you go further away from the core, from the focus where the seizures arise uh, and these atrial discharges arise, whereas the GABA signal is maximal in a sort of ring around that um, that focus. Uh, and you can see that uh, as, as a sort of another way of plotting it is to look at the the distance from the focus and look at the maximal size of the signal. As you can see, it's it sort of falls away with distance for glutamate, but for GABA, it's maximal in a sort of um, in an annulus around the, the focus. And we saw that whether we recorded the seizures uh, and atrial discharges evoked by picrotoxin or by pilocarpine got the same result. We also saw these, these waves of GABA and glutamate propagated in different directions, and we're not entirely sure uh, exactly how the, you know all the mechanisms underneath this. We have some models to explain that. But as I say, we think this is a, a, a this is uh, consistent with the concept of an inhibitory annulus that squeezes the focus, uh, a bit like a fire blanket. Uh, and I'll forget this section. Now, we then thought, well, if there's a lot of glutamate and GABA associated with the onset of these seizures, could we actually use the glutamate as a way of, of harnessing another type of closed loop inhibition of, of the cortex? So normally we think of glutamate as an endogenous excitatory neurotransmitter, whereas GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. So the question was, could we use glutamate to trigger an inhibitory uh, um, signal, uh, so effectively using an inhibitory receptor for glutamate. Well, of course, the excitatory, um, the glutamate receptors in the brain and the mammalian brain are excitatory, and the um, uh, receptor for, for GABA are inhibitory. But we found, and Andreas and Yi Chen did this, that we could use a glutamate gated chloride channel from C. elegans. Uh, so this is a, a chloride channel, so it's an inhibitory channel activated by glutamate. Uh, and we could use this as another gene therapy strategy. So we put this into a lentivirus. There's a picture of a horse there because ivermectin uh, is a drug which is, acts as a drug, uh, as a receptor agonist uh, of um, glucl. And so we did this in, a, in another epilepsy model. And again, uh, we, we, um, we showed a highly effective uh, um, way of stopping seizures using this glutamate gated chloride channel. And again, these animals did not show any off-target effects when we expressed it in eloquent parts of the cortex. And so we recently re-engineered it in order to be able to put it into an edno associated virus in AMV. And this is Stephen and Laura who did this work. Uh, and this is again, well tolerated and we can stop the seizures quite effectively. I'll skip over that. All right, so to summarize, we've used, oh, sorry, this is the wrong summary. Um, we, we've used a number of different strategies to stop seizures using potassium channels, uh, using um, a, a CFOS activity dependent promoter and using a, a glutamate gated chloride channel to achieve seizure suppression. Uh, we are trying to advance some of these strategies to the clinic. And so we founded this company called Epilepsy GTX to try to take the simplest of those strategies using the potassium channel uh, under the Canis promoter uh, into uh, the clinic. And we're hoping to start clinical trials in about a year's time. So thank you very much for your attention. Here are photographs of, of uh, many of the people who contributed to this work, uh, as well as other work I haven't had time to, to uh, talk about. So thank you. I'd be very, obviously very happy to